All right, and it looks like we are live. So as we're getting started this evening, I want to encourage everyone to introduce yourself in the comments, let us know where you're joining us from. Um, and thank you for joining us this evening for the second part of our two-part series on making an impact this legislative session. Tonight, we'll be sharing some legislative calls to action and pieces of legislation that we're watching this session. Um, and to get us started, we are going to start with introductions, just as last time. Um, again, my name is Emily Plunkett. I am our manager of outreach uh, with the Hoosier Environmental Council. I joined the team back in August, and I've loved uh, working for the environment for Indiana so far. Um, Tim, please introduce yourself. Good evening, everybody. I'm Tim Maloney. I'm senior policy director at HEC and have been on staff for uh, for some time. Fantastic. Thank you, Tim. All right, Delaney, take it away. Hi, I'm Delaney. I'm the senior outreach associate and I am joining back from being an intern last session and I'm excited to work on this session with all of you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So we have a great agenda planned for you this evening. Um, we have bills um, from all of our areas of focus as an organization. Um, we'll begin with environmental health related bills, um, talking about HB, ele HB 1100 and the climate legislation SB 255 and SCR 3. We'll move then into land and conservation related legislation, talking about coal ash, um, talking about carbon capture and sequestration, as well as a wetlands tax credit bill. Um, then we'll be moving into sustainable economy related legislation, talking about some solar bills that are currently on the docket, as well as um, SB 411 on commercial, and sol commercial solar and wind energy. And to wrap things up, we have um, a bill on industry influence over environmental agencies, HB 1063. Um, before we dive into our lengthy agenda, um, I do want to give one more logistical reminder, um, same as last time, any comments that you have on any comments or questions that you have throughout this evening, please be sure to drop those in our comments section below. We'd love to hear your thoughts and your questions here. All right, so now we are going to begin with environmental health related legislation, and we'll be starting with HB 1100 with Tim. Thanks, Emily. Well, HB 1100, uh, its formal title is Agency Oversight and Rulemaking Procedures. And it's a very broad reaching bill. And uh, just tell you about some of the provisions in it. Uh, it has language uh, limiting uh, the term of executive orders and how those orders might be reviewed. These are orders issued by, by the governor. Uh, it would limit um, the pendency uh, of emergency rules adopted by a state agency in response to, uh, to emergencies of some kind. Uh, it has other language that would um, uh, provide that new rules with a new regulatory provision, uh, when they're adopted, a, an existing rule with the regulatory pr provision has to be repealed. So it's like a a no net gain of, of any new agency regulations. Uh, sunsets agency rules uh, more quickly, uh, reducing that time from seven years to four years, uh, and generally has uh, uh, inserts more legislative oversight of the executive branch activity of administrative rulemaking. Uh, but right in the middle of all that is language that that many of you may recognize no more stringent than. This is a policy that uh, has a proposed policy that's been before the General Assembly many times and something that HEC has, has worked on and defended against for many years. And this, uh, this, uh, this year's HB 1100 also contains no more stringent than language, which means, uh, which says that uh, state of Indiana uh, our agencies cannot adopt a, a state rule or regulation that's more stringent than a comparable federal rule or regulation or impose a financial penalty of some kind that would be more strict or larger than what 
would be allowed under federal law. And uh, there are many, many problems with this policy. And uh, first of which is that uh, in our system of um, uh, environmental policy and law in the United States, the 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 big uh, national environmental laws like the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, uh, their implementation is delegated to the states. And with that delegation comes uh, a lot of discretion in uh, how those laws are implemented and applied at the state level. And, and that's, a, that's a, good, a good concept because conditions on the ground among the various states can be quite different. So it's a form of flexibility that's good for the states and good for uh, those who are regulated by these laws or, and for the general public who um, would hope that our agencies would uh, customize the laws to, to solve our problems and improve Indiana's environment. So uh, with that discretion, uh, it, that makes it harder for anybody to determine when, when a state action is more stringent than a federal action. And that term, more stringent than, is not defined in the bill. So who would define it? Uh, that's a good question. It's not specified. In reality, it'd probably be the courts. And these any disputes over whether something's more stringent than corresponding federal rules would end up in the courts, which is a very inefficient way to, to provide for um, environmental or any other uh, state agency regulations. Uh, some examples of how, in terms of environmental rulemaking, where that flexibility and discretion comes in is um, uh, our state's water quality standards uh, have numeric limits for certain types of pollutants. And of course, it's easy to compare a state numeric limit with a federal numeric limit. But there are also other uh, standards that are what's known as narrative standards. And uh, that's a description of of what is allowed or permitted in terms of uh, releasing a pollutant into the environment. And so um, it, it's much more um, uncertain how you would compare a narrative, a state narrative standard to a federal narrative standard, even if that existed. And the reason for having a narrative standard versus a numeric standard is that um, it may, may be difficult uh, to establish a numeric standard in the time needed or the conditions of the, of the activity may, may make that more difficult. So um, one example of that is uh, stormwater regulation. And uh, that's an instance where a, a lot of the standards governing what level of stormwater or polluted stormwater can be uh, released to the environment is, uh, is described in the form of of um, uh, turbidity and um, qualities like that. And uh, instead of having a numeric limit that has to be uh, complied with, there it, these rules impose best practices for how you would, how a discharger uh, would limit uh, the, the polluted stormwater that they might release. So those are some of the uh, examples of why uh, this policy would be uh, ironically very harmful, including to the regulated community and would lead to more federal involvement in state regulation than less, uh, just because of the uncertainty uh, that would be created by this policy. So uh, that's something that we feel very strongly is, is very poor policy. This particular bill applies to just about every state agency where in the past we've typically uh, been confronted with bills that just addressed uh, limitations on environmental rulemaking. So it's a very broad bill. The bill is, uh, has come out of House committee and is awaiting action on the, the House of Representatives floor. And um, uh, so far, it's not been posted for consideration on the House floor calendars, but uh, we still expect that to happen. So the call to action here is, uh, is to uh, contact your state representative and ask them to vote against uh, House Bill 1100. Thank you, Tim. Now we are going to transition to 
um, some information on the climate legislation currently out there with Delaney. Yes, so um, the current climate legislation includes uh, Senate Bill 255 and SCR, the Resolution 3. First, uh, the Senate Bill 255 is going to establish a statewide climate change task force that will develop a climate action plan by a certain set date, as well as um, create a forecast report of greenhouse gases emitted by Indiana utilities from 2022 to 2050. The SCR3 is a resolution that formally acknowledges the problem of climate change by addressing scientific research that has been published by Purdue University. And current action on this bill, it has been referred to the Committee on Environmental Affairs, as well as uh, two new co-authors have been added, making it a bipartisan bill. Our call to action is the same as confront the climate crisis, which is to call Chairman Mesmer to hear Senate Bill 255 and SCR3 in the Committee on Environmental Affairs. Um, I've listed his phone number and email down below, as well as to call or email your own senator to support Senate Bill 255 and SCR 3, as well as just to support Confront the Climate Crisis and their work on this with Senator Ron Alting as we continue to follow this bill through uh, the State House. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Delaney, for that. Now we will be moving into land and conservation related legislation. We're gonna begin with a couple bills on coal ash that we're currently watching. So a little bit of background, Indiana has more coal ash ponds than any other state. Just gonna let that sink in for a second. Indiana has more coal ash ponds than any other state. Um, and what coal ash is in the first place, when coal is burned, this is material left over. Um, so that is what coal ash is. This waste material contains toxic heavy metals that threaten or that are known as carcinogens. Um, these include lead and arsenic, just to name a few. Um, they're carcinogens and can increase the risk of cancer. They can damage the nervous system and brain and interfere with a young or unborn child's development. Oftentimes, coal ash is disposed of in unlined pits in areas prone to flooding. Um, there are some sites where these pits are deep enough to have coal ash sitting in groundwater and are contaminating it as a result. There are four instances throughout the state where coal ash has been contaminated or has contaminated private wells. Um, these include um, in Porter, Hamilton, Vermilion, and Gibson counties. At a location in Dearborn County, coal ash contaminated groundwater is threatening municipal wells. Um, so given these detrimental impacts of coal ash, um, and the amount of coal ash Indiana has produced. This is an issue that HEC has watched closely for a while now, and we are ex excited to see two bills um, this session that aim to address Indiana's problem with coal ash. Um, one in the House is 1355, authored by Representative Pat Boy and co-authored by Representative Maureen Bauer, uh, both from Northern Indiana. And one is, and the one in the Senate is 412, authored by Senator Rodney Cole of Chesterton and co-authored by Senator Sue Glick of LaGrange. Um, something of note here with SB 412 is that it is a bipartisan bill, which we are excited to see for sure. These bills focus on safer disposal practices for coal ash, ensuring that it is out of floodplains and out of contact with groundwater. While the Senate bill focuses solely on safe disposal, the House bill also includes details for prioritizing local workers and helping to address this issue. You may have seen some additional information in the news recently on coal ash where the EPA clarified the federal coal ash rules. Even with this new ruling from the EPA, we believe it is important for Indiana to protect its water resources from coal ash contamination, not just depending on rules from the federal government, which may change from administration to administration. So some calls to action for you this evening. Um, it's kind of similar to some we've heard already. Um, these bills have been assigned to the Environmental Affairs Committees 
uh, in both the House and in, in, in the Senate, and we would like these bills to be heard by Chairman Mesmer and by Chairman Speedy. You can see their phone numbers here on the screen. Uh, we ask you to call them and urge them to get this bill a hearing. All right, now we are going to move into um, information on carbon capture and sequestration. Thanks again, Emily. Uh, there are three bills that have been filed this year uh, dealing with uh, carbon capture and sequestration. And this is sequestration uh, underground as a form of geologic storage. Uh, and uh, two of these bills uh, are similar to legislation that was considered last year. And both of those re uh, refer to um, or affect the proposed Wabash Valley Resources Project near Terre Haute, where uh, the company uh, intends to uh, to turn uh, petroleum coke and biomass into hydrogen, and that process will create carbon dioxide. And their proposal is to inject that underground to keep it out of the atmosphere. Uh, so those two bills are Senate Bill 265 and House Bill 1249. And um, uh, the HEC is a, opposed to both 265 and 1249 uh, for a, a significant provision in the law that provides uh, liability exemption. It's not blanket, but it's, uh, it's significant liability exemption for the company in terms of any damages that may be caused to private property or, uh, or other uh, personal interest or human impacts, environmental impacts in terms of uh, legal damages for those, uh, for those impacts. So the, the bill provides that um, a level of legal uh, protection there for the company. And we think that's a, a very uh, premature and risky action in that so, so much is yet to be learned about this project overall and the uh, carbon injection elements of the project as well. Uh, what's more, the company has to uh, file for and obtain a class six underground injection permit from the US EPA. This is required by the Safe Drinking Water Act. And that process will also provide a review and public participation component that will help disclose more information about the project and where the carbon is proposed to be injected and uh, how that will be done uh, and various safeguards uh, for that process. The, the um, limitations of the federal permitting process is that that uh, that permit is focused on um, ensuring protection for underground supplies of drinking water. So other considerations, whether it's impacts to health or other types of in environmental impacts or um, impacts to pro private property are not addressed uh, and are not um, considered resolved just by issuance of this uh, EPA class six underground injection permits. So, uh, We'd like to see more protections and um, certainly the notion of, of any legal uh, protection or exemptions from legal liability are, are not at all warranted at this time. So we, uh, we have opposed those two bills. Uh, House Bill 1249 came out of uh, House committee yesterday, the House Natural Resources Committee, and we'll be moving to the the House floor for further action. Senate Bill 265 has not had a committee hearing yet. It is assigned to uh, Senate Environmental Affairs Committee. Uh, the third bill is um, a new proposal, one we've not seen before, House Bill 1209. And this bill would create a, a fairly comprehensive um, carbon sequestration program in the state of Indiana. It's not specific to a single project like the other two bills are uh, and provides a, a fairly thorough process for uh, how that those projects are, uh, are examined, uh, provides that any 
uh, any storage uh, underground of carbon dioxide would require um, compensation or some form of consideration for the the surface owners or or owners of mineral rights. It it would ensure that conflicts with oil and gas extraction or other mineral mineral extraction are um, uh, would be uh, resolved uh, appropriately and. Um, uh, then would provide that uh, once the carbon injection process is over with after a 10 year waiting period, the, um, the company that, that did the carbon sequestration uh, could seek to have the state take uh, ownership of that site and then be responsible for managing it into the future. So there are, um, there are some concerns with this bill as well, but it's, uh, certainly a more thorough and comprehensive approach to, um, to underground sequestration of carbon dioxide. That bill also came out of committee yesterday and um, will be awaiting uh, floor action as well. So we're, uh, HEC is taking more of a wait and see approach to House Bill 1209. Um, do have con some concerns about it, but uh, it's certainly uh, distinctive from the other two bills, which we do oppose. And so the calls to action here are um, number one, to uh, contact your state representative, ask them to uh, oppose House Bill 1249 to vote against it on the House floor, uh, to contact your state senator and urge them to oppose Senate Bill 265, uh, and um, uh, we, again, we don't know exactly when or if that that bill will be heard. So um, that's the calls to action there on carbon capture and sequestration. Fantastic, thank you, Tim. All right, moving forward, we'll be talking about a wetlands tax credit bill with Delaney. Yes, so the wetlands tax credit bill, um, HB 1334. Um, this is in uh, response to Senate Bill 389, which was passed last session, which reduced uh, significantly protection on the state's remaining wetlands, um, about 80 to 90 percent of um, Indiana's remaining wetlands were her state. Um, and this opened about 600,000 acres up for development. Um, and House Bill 1334 helps the state's remaining wetlands with a tax break for property owners who preserve wetlands on their land. Um, this is by Representative Boy, and it was introduced into the Committee on Ways and Means on January 11th. We are hoping to get it heard by Chairman Brown in that committee. Um, you can call or email Chairman Brown to hear House Bill 1334 below and call or email your state representative to support House Bill 1334. Um, this bill also requires item to inspect each wetland, um, which is usually inspected initially every four years. Um, it's also going after property taxes, um, which would give a tax break on those. And Representative Arrington was also added as a co-author on the 11th as well. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Delaney. Now we will be moving into sustainable economy related legislation. We're going to begin with an overview of some of the rooftop solar bills that we're seeing in the session. And we are very excited to see seven different bills related to rooftop solar, um, which is a breakthrough in itself. Um, some even have Republican sponsors, so we're very excited to share about some of these with you. While we don't have time to go into detail into all of them tonight, we do want to introduce um, them all to here, here with you right now. Um, some work to address uh, net metering, which is tragically reversed by law signed in 2017. Uh, bill, a bill authored by Representative Tony Cook, House Bill 1136, extends net metering by three years and lifts the percentage of electricity 
that can come from net metering from 1.5% to 3%. As a bill announced or introduced by Senator Shelley Yoder takes a more aggressive stance and lifts that percentage um, from 1.5 to 5%, ensuring more Hoosiers can benefit from rooftop solar energy. Um, Senate Bill 248 and House Bill 1304 also work to address net metering, specifically through an aspect of net metering called monthly netting, which I'm going to dive into deeper into the next slides. Uh, the last three bills go beyond the problems from the 2017 legislation and address other aspects of rooftop solar. HB House Bill 1196, which I will talk about more in the slides to come, was authored by Representative Mike Speedy and helps to address the problem of homeowners associations preventing residents from installing rooftop solar. And House Bills 1250 and SB, or sorry, House Bill 1250 and Senate Bill 313 both address the concept of community solar. Uh, for various reasons, homeowners may not be able to install solar panels themselves. Um, whether it's lack of space on their roof or not wanting to cut down trees which shade their roof. Um, the concept of community solar allows them to buy shares in a larger solar project and become an owner of solar that way. So now we're gonna dive into these bills on monthly netting, SB 248 and House Bill 1304. So as I mentioned before, the General Assembly passed a bill in 2017 that would mean those who install solar panels after June of this year, after June 2022, would no longer receive the retail rate for electricity they produce and do not use and send back to the grid. In other words, that rate they would be charged for electricity or the rate they would be charged for electricity they use from the grid would be higher than the compensation they receive from utilities for sending surplus energy back to the grid. SB 248 and HB 1304 both work to address a related issue called monthly netting. Uh, SB 248 was introduced by Senator Liz Brown um, and it would ensure that solar panel owners are credited monthly for the solar energy they produce but do not use. Uh, by crediting solar panel owners um, properly for their surplus energy, this would ensure solar is more accessible for Hoosiers around the state its companion bill in the House is 1304 and was introduced by Representative Alan Morrison. So I, I will admit this is a little bit complicated. So we did um, work with our in-house expert, Jesse Carbonda, to come up with a hypothetical for you to try to explain the concept of monthly netting a little bit better. Um, so you can see here on the left is what would happen if monthly netting as proposed by these two bills was enacted. Um, so this method of calculation would in the end lead to a credit for your bill. Um, whereas if monthly netting was not enacted, you would actually owe 250 um, in comparison. So I'm gonna leave this on the screen for a second. Again, this is some pretty technical stuff and there are lots of resources on our website um, to, so you can educate yourself more on these issues. Um, so our calls to action, um, both of these bills are currently sitting in utilities committees and we are awaiting hearings for these bills. Um, please tell your Senator and representative to support SB 248 and House Bill 1304. We would love for them to get a hearing. All right, and now we're going to talk about um, HOA rooftop solar with House Bill 1196. So this is another bill we're watching and some Hoosiers have faced barriers with their own homeowners associations, HOAs, that have prevented them or made it difficult for them to go solar. And House Bill 1196 introduced by Representative Mike Speedy of Indianapolis, these homeowners would have a pathway to go solar even in light of these current homeowners association restrictions. Homeowners can petition their HOA to put up rooftop solar that follows a process an HOA has to amend a covenant. Um, this bill actually passed out of committee last week um, with a 10 to zero vote in favor and now is at the house floor. Um, please tell your representative to vote in support of House Bill 1196. Now we're going to move into Senate Bill 411 with Tim. 
Thanks, Emily. Uh, Senate Bill 411 is uh, addresses the siting of commercial scale wind and solar projects around Indiana. And it is a uh, successor proposal to a bill that was introduced last session that also addressed the same topic. And this addresses uh, is intended to address uh, local government regulation of solar and wind projects and to create some uh, some uniformity statewide in how local units of government, whether a county or a, a city or town, might regulate these projects uh, under their own ordinance powers. And the bill last year was uh, more of a mandatory approach that required uh, local government units to adopt uh, minimum state standards in their own ordinances um, for the oversight of, of wind and solar energy. And of course, that is uh, uh, in, in contradiction to um, Indiana's principle of home rule that uh, the local government units should uh, retain a lot of authority to govern uh, activities in their own communities, particularly when it comes to um, to land use and what happens on what types of activity activities happen on the land within their jurisdiction. Uh, and that's typically done through the planning and zoning process. So that bill did not pass. And uh, this year's version is Senate Bill 411, uh, introduced by Senator Mesmer in the Senate. And it takes a different approach. It's an incentive-based program, would create a, um, a, uh, a center in the Indiana Economic Development Corporation that would work with local governments to help them uh, adopt uh, solar and wind energy standards, again, that are, are minimum state standards. But in this instance, uh, localities would not be required to do this, but if they choose to do it, they would receive an incentive in the form of payments uh, to the county government or the city government based on the amount of uh, kilowatt hours of energy generated by the projects. Uh, so it's a, a voluntary and incentive-based program. And then to get that incentive, the local governments would have to adopt the adopt and implement these uh, minimum state standards on on uh, siting uh, wind or solar projects and how it, what what distances they'd have to be set back from other land uses or other properties and and other conditions like that. Uh, uh, for HEC, one of the principal considerations are the uh, standards and requirements for commercial solar installations and. And if you've been following our work on this, you know that we have been a, an advocate for uh, for pollinator friendly solar and uh, an incorporation of that outcome in these standards for solar farms. And so, uh, the a main concern with Senate Bill 411, uh, which was the same as as last year's bill, is that uh, the language would allow a landowner veto of uh, the, the uh, requirement to plant pollinator friendly uh, vegetation um, in and around and under solar installations. And um, we think that will serve to, to greatly reduce if it does go into place would reduce the amount of pollinator plantings that actually occur. Um, and so, uh, uh, we would hope that that um, would be changed during the process. Overall, the the incentive-based approach we think is a, a good approach, and we think politically it'll have more uh, prospect for passage. But uh, we certainly think the pollinator solely solar aspect of um, the legislation uh, needs some work, and and we'll be working in that regard as the bill moves forward. Uh, Senate Bill 411 is um, uh, being heard in the Senate Utilities Committee tomorrow morning, and uh, that's chaired by Senator Eric Cook. And um, if it's acted on in committee, then of course it goes to the floor where the entire Senate will have a chance to, to vote on that. So our call to action is for um, 
everybody to contact your state senator and Senator Messmer, uh, the bill author, and encourage uh, the, the bill to be improved uh, to address the importance of ensuring that uh, pollinator friendly plantings are incorporated as part of solar project development. Thank you, Tim. All right, we're going to keep it with Tim, but we're moving into um, an area of legislation that doesn't necessarily fit nicely into one of HEC's main focus areas, but we're still very concerned about it. Uh, and this is House Bill 1063. Thanks again, Emily. Uh, House Bill 1063 uh, deals with the process for uh, judicial review of uh, agency uh, law judge decisions or administrative law judges who um, are the first level of, of uh, review of an agency decision that, that uh, a particular party may not like it could be the uh, it could be an environmental permit that the company receiving the permit uh, does not like or it could be uh, a neighbor of the project uh, challenging uh, the permit for a project because they think their community will be harmed by the project and in in, in certain instances it can be uh, organizations like ours that um, have a concern about a, a permitted project and seek to have review of the permitting decision. And so that, that review first goes uh, through an administrative review in front of, of an environmental law judge in the case of, of decisions made by the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. Uh, and uh, once that administrative uh, law judge makes a, a decision and the parties uh, have the chance, the, the parties that lose that outcome have the chance to seek judicial review in, in a court uh, of the decision. And, and under current law, that review is, um, uh, when that happens, the courts typically give a lot of deference to the agencies on the facts of the case and the facts that were introduced and the evidence that was introduced during the administrative process. Uh, but the courts reserve the right to, to uh, decide questions of law, the legal issues and how the, the laws apply to this particular case. Well, uh, House Bill 1063 would change that process quite a bit. And instead, um, Number one would would largely eliminate that deference to the state agencies that that courts allow on on the factual matters, and would also allow new in evidence to be introduced during a court proceeding, which uh, typically does not happen now uh, because the courts are looking at the questions of law, not facts. And um, in the case of enforcement actions. Uh, it would put the burden on uh, proof on the agency to defend its enforcement action. And um, uh, overall, we think it, this could have a very chilling effect on, on agency actions uh, where they think that um, the private sector uh, industry would, would seek to, to tie their decisions up in court for years and years. Um, and relitigate what was already litigated in the administrative proceeding. And uh, so just one more element of this is that um, because courts typically only look at the, the questions of law in judicial review, uh, there is no uh, procedure for introducing new evidence or uh, uh, re re uh, questioning witnesses or having witnesses in depositions, a lot of procedural activities to bring out the facts and evidence that are very time consuming and costly, and uh, and that happens during the administrative process, but typically would not be repeated uh, when the case is in court. Well, under this law, that process could be wholly repeated um, in court uh, with witnesses and evidence and depositions and. Uh, and testimony and uh, very expensive and time consuming process. So the, 
the parties that have resources, uh, which typically is is big industry, would would be able to prevail um, either versus a, a citizens organization, a, an individual resident who was part of this process, or in some cases even the state agencies. So um, it is. Uh, we think would really change the the balance of, of fairness in these types of cases. And uh, so for those reasons, we're opposing the bill. And um, uh, right now that bill is um, has come out of committee. Uh, it was introduced by Representative Chris Jeter of Indianapolis and uh, is I think awaiting action on the House floor for uh, a final vote. So it is very important that you reach out to your state representative and urge them to vote no on House Bill 1063. And you can read more about the issue on our um, on our uh, Bill Watch page. Uh, it is a very um, uh, nuanced issue from a legal standpoint. And while it may not seem immediately important to the work that we do, because HEC does pursue pursue environmental challenges in court, uh, we think it's very important and important for um, the making sure that these legal proceedings are, uh, are as fair as possible. Yes, for sure. Thank you so much for that explanation, Tim, and for introducing HB 1063. So that was the end of our set agenda for this evening. I've been watching our comments come through. We've had some great comments from our audience. Thank you all for your thoughts so far. I haven't necessarily seen any questions come in. So if you have any questions on what we've shared this evening with you so far, um, a piece of legislation, where it currently is um, in the legislative process, please be sure to put those in the comments and you can you know, take those during this time. We do have about 20 minutes left in our scheduled time this evening, and we'd love to be able to answer any questions you have. Hey, Emily, there was one uh, comment. Uh, Victoria uh, commented that she doesn't know of any facilities operating on the ground that demonstrate carbon capture and sequestration capacity. And, uh, she's certainly right about that in Indiana. No one is doing that here. I think there are uh, have been two uh, carbon injection permits issued in the state of Illinois, and um, uh, not sure what the status of those projects is. But it's still a a new and and um, not fully uh, vetted technology. Not a lot of experience of the. Uh, longevity and security of, of carbon sequestered underground and and from a policy standpoint any emphasis on on um, mitigating carbon that's been emitted uh, overlooks the the higher priority of simply reducing or eliminating carbon emissions and so uh, that needs to continue to be the top priority of, of our uh, national and state policies is to reduce carbon, reduce or eliminate carbon emissions. Um, but, you know, being, being practical that not all carbon emissions are going to be eliminated overnight, there is uh, some merit in examining ways to mitigate those impacts, which are already being felt. And, uh, and um, so mitigation activity does need to proceed in, in tandem with uh, trying to reduce or eliminate emissions uh, to the maximum extent possible. Yes, thank you for that insight, Tim. I, I'm wondering, you mentioned Illinois. Are there any other states that have pilot projects such as this, um, anywhere else in the world where we're seeing this type of thing based on your knowledge? Well, there are uh, certainly in areas of the country where there's a lot of oil and gas production, there has been um, uh, the use of CO2 as a, um, for enhanced oil and gas extraction processes uh, where, uh, where you have a deposit of oil or gas that's more difficult to pump out. Sometimes the injection of CO2 can help raise the pressure and, um, and serve to bring out the, uh, 
uh, allow someone, a company to pump out the oil or gas um, more quickly and efficiently. So um, it, it's, it's being used for different purposes around the country, uh, but um, the, the practice of just injecting it and then storing it for really in perpetuity is of course not something that's been uh, closely examined or analyzed or uh, uh, verified that it's a safe and secure process well into the future. And, and um, so there are a lot of, uh, of answers that are still needed with respect to, to carbon sequestration. Of course, uh, uh, another form of sequestration uh, uh, through natural solutions like forests and soils uh, uh, is a um, something that uh, you know we're very supportive of and would like to see an expansion of that work both in the state and nationally uh, uh, both because it uh, it can help sequester more carbon and also provides many other co-benefits that are important even if the carbon benefits are are very modest uh, so uh, a lot of activity happening policy-wise and research-wise around the world on, on these issues, but uh, certainly they, the processes and examination needs to be transparent with you know, full public involvement and be sure that the, uh, that the claimed benefits are actually occurring. Absolutely, absolutely. You need to make sure that you know, it's carbon that is potentially sequestered underground um, doesn't have seismic impacts or could potentially contaminate our water resources. We need to make sure that those are protected um, with this, with these policies, yes. Yes. I'm gonna advance the slide and bring us back to what we've covered today. Um, maybe this will spur some additional questions from our audience. Uh, I still haven't seen any come in just yet, which which is all right. Of course, we'd love to take them and answer them, but um, we can keep talking up here if not. Um, see, of course, we you know covered um, bills having to do with environmental health today. Um, we've talked about land and conservation-related bills, um, including one on you know a couple on coal ash that are currently um, in the legislative process, as well as you know carbon capture and sequestration, like Tim was just sharing about. Um, we shared quite a bit on some solar and um, renewable energy siting bills um, having to do with our sustainable economy initiatives at the Environmental Council. And then, of course, it doesn't quite fit into um, either, you know, all three of those categories. But the last bill that we shared about, of course, was 1063, um, having to do with industry influence over our environmental agencies here in Indiana. So, so Tim, I'm, I'm wondering, we did receive a couple of questions in our last session having to do um, with lawmakers who um, are potentially retiring or who are up for re-election. I'm wondering um, if you can speak a little bit more about um, how HEC looks at lawmakers and um, tracks whether or not they're a friend um, or uh, potentially an opponent of the environment here in Indiana. Mm -hmm. Well, Emily, we do that in many ways, and um, we. But just to to preface this by saying that um, uh, as a as the type of nonprofit that HEC is, we cannot engage in electoral activities or support uh, political candidates or endorse them in any way. Uh, but we can certainly keep track of their records and. Um, uh, and their activities and educate our, our members and supporters about that. And so one way we do that is at the end of, of every session on our Bill Watch page, we'll, we'll acknowledge those legislators who were very helpful to us during the session in, in one way or another by introducing bills, by, by voting for bills or working behind the scenes to, to either defeat or um, gain passage of important bills. So many, many elements of activities beyond just the simple uh, roll call votes that every legislator casts in terms of evaluating uh, whether they are, uh, you know, friendly to the environment or, or not. And so um, uh, 
that's something we do. And, uh, you know, of course we pay attention to, to well, which legislators are, are, are friends and champions and, and recognize the, the great value of the legislators perform in, in working for environmental protection and, and protecting our natural resources and fish and wildlife and, and outdoor spaces and uh, public health and, and the environment. So uh, again, we can't, uh, you know, we can't tell you to vote for or against somebody or endorse someone, but um, you know, we can share information about their record and uh, the, the work that they do at the state house. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Tim. I remember before I joined HUC, that page was especially helpful for me as I made my decisions as a voter. Thank you. All right, looking back on our comments and questions, I'm still not seeing any here, which is all right. Um, we won't We're stick happy to here. answer any questions. Yes, that is what we're here for. We're here to be a resource and a help to you this legislative session, making sure you're advocating for the environment um, here in Indiana. Uh, and Emily, you're probably going to mention this. We, you know, you can keep tabs on what's going on at the state house and what we're doing, both in our weekly electronic newsletters uh, that you can sign up for on our web page, as well as our Bill Watch page, which uh, maintains information about the bills that we're tracking and working on. Um, and I think, um, uh, you know, we will be considering that about doing a, a, a check in halfway through the session and update people live about what's happened the first half and what to be watching for and working on in the second half of the session. Absolutely. You called it, Tim. That was that was on my next slide. You, you called okay. me. Um, so yes, of course, be, be sure you're watching our Bill Watch 2022 page. Uh, I find it really helpful to bookmark this uh, in my browser. That way it's easy, easily accessed. We're, we're sure to keep this updated um, with information on these bills that we're watching. Um, and of course, every Saturday we send out our weekly e-newsletters. Um, these are comprehensive and also include events you can look for um, to engage your, legislat your legislators um, and other events hosted by our partners. Um, and of course, we are on social media. That's where you're watching us here tonight. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We'd love for you to connect with us and share the, you know, our calls to action there as well. Um, here we do have our emails listed. If you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, you know, I, I know we haven't gotten any questions here tonight, but please feel free to send those to us um, and we'd be happy to help you. Um, actually looking, looking here and in our comments, I am seeing a question. Um, it has to do with the no more stringent ban legislation. Um, it has been, Larry says it's been introduced many uh, in many past sessions. Is there any reason to believe it has more chance this session? Well, that's a good question, Larry, and hello to you. I recall your name from the days when you were very active on the uh, environmental rulemaking front. Uh, we certainly hope it doesn't have any greater chance. And, and you may recall a couple of years ago, uh, the legislature did add uh, new language to items rulemaking process, which required a disclosure of proposed rules that are more stringent than it was not an outright prohibition, which is the case in House Bill 1100. But having said that, I'll note that there is a, um, uh, for a variety of reasons, a very strong anti-agency sentiment at the State House this year. And you see that in a, uh, a number of bills uh, that would affect administrative activities and rulemaking and affect the authority of the governor uh, in addressing emergencies. And um, so um, the concern is uh, whether that sentiment will will carry the day and, and result in, uh, you know, adoption of some very poor policies, including if it would 
if House Bill 1100 would would be approved, both for its its entire content as well as the the um, the no more stringent than language, which um, you know from a, a small government conservative standpoint, which is the the general position of many of our uh, public officials, it um, it would just have the opposite effect of what they what they think it would have, and um, lead to more federal involvement in Indiana than than less. So um, uh, we're certainly going to be working uh, with many of our allies and, and consulting with agency folks um, and pushing back on this, and hope that. Uh, uh, that better wisdom prevails and it uh, and it's defeated. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, Larry, again for your question here. Well, we're still waiting to see if we have any last minute questions come in. Uh, I know we're getting close to the end of our time together here this evening. I do want to draw your attention to another event that's happening this evening. Uh, just 30 minutes from now, um, our friends at, you know, North just transitioned Northwest Indiana at the Hoosier chapter of the Sierra Club, confront the climate crisis, uh, the Sunrise Movement in Indianapolis, uh, Citizens Action Coalition, and Indiana Beyond Coal are hosting this Indiana Environmental and Climate Justice Legislative Roundtable, which our colleague Indra Frank is speaking at. So we would love for you to join us at that event as well. Um, it'll be a great time to dive deeper into this legislation. Great. Um, any closing thoughts, Delaney and Tim? I'm wondering, um, you know, as we move ahead in this legislation or in this legislative session, what, what are you taking with you? Um, what are you thinking about moving ahead? Go ahead, Delaney. Um, yes, I am hoping to stay positive. It is a short session, so it will it will be really quick. So to make sure to stay on our toes, as they say, and um, keep watching these bills and making sure we're contacting our representatives and our senators. Absolutely, thank you, Delaney. Tim, what are, what are you taking with you? What are you thinking about? Well, I'd certainly echo Delaney's comments. The short sessions, uh, you really have to be there to understand just the the pace uh, and volume of activity that ha happens in a very short amount of time. And certainly in terms of our work to, to respond to it and get word out to everybody who's interested um, and will help us uh, take action to, uh, to influence what happens, uh, it's, it's a real scramble. And, uh, but it's, it's work that, you know, needs to be done and and really all interests that that participate in the lawmaking process are um, uh, you know in the same situation uh, the legislative uh, timetable waits for no one whether you're um, a lobbyist or a citizen or um, any other interest who participates in the legislature it moves quickly it moves on its own time schedule so uh, for those folks who, and, and we really appreciate this, who help us out by uh, and help out the cause and the, and the cause of Indiana's environment by uh, communicating with their legislators and their, their own networks, um, you know, it's just important to, to act swiftly. And um, uh, if you hear about something you're concerned about, uh, it's important to reach out right away because things just happen very quickly. Uh, and it does make a difference. It, sometimes it may seem like uh, your voice is not being heard, but it, it definitely makes a difference. And um, and the more folks who speak out, uh, the more difference it will make. I, I think that's a great note to end on. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Delaney, for your time and for sharing those thoughts with us this evening. And of course, thank you to everyone who has joined us here on Facebook Live. We really appreciate your time and your advocacy for the environment. And again, hope you will join our colleague, Dr. Indra Frank at this event at 7.30. I'll be sure to drop that link in the comments below. All right, thank you all so much and happy advocating.